Hey everybody, uh, <laughs> I almost started a new video. I forgot to turn off the Wi-Fi because we're away from the house. It's Chris and Kim. And we, as promised, uh, this is our day eight, second week now of our physical distancing uh, live broadcasts that we're going to um, post up to our Facebook pages as well as our Wolf Camp website as part of an ongoing series during this time where a lot of us have to uh, stay away from one another physically but uh, connect. And uh, learning these earth skills and planting gardens so important uh, for both financial and food security during this time, uh, just in case this needs to go on for a while. Uh, right here, I wanted to start in our cattail pond, and reason being is because cattails are a great thing to make um, spin natural rope with, also great for making thatched um, roofs and sitting mats and all sorts of different basketry is really critical. Um, and uh, as well as we've got here some bulrushes or tulies uh, that we put in this cattail pond. Oh, there's a nice duck over there. As promised today, we're going to uh, show you how to make rope out of all natural materials. And while Kim is showing you how to do that over by the fire pit, uh, I'm going to be setting up a bed pillow blanket fire method, starting fire method and start it with a fire steel. And then tomorrow we're going to do bow drill and continue with some other fire skills the following day. Moving on, maybe back into gardening and some birding. Goes ducks out of the pond um, later this week or next week uh, because birding is the ultimate in social distancing. So I'm going to, um, Kimmer, what do you have there? Previously collected cattails, yes. it looks like. So these leaves right here are all the leaves from the cattails that grew in our pond, and so I just harvested them. This was our, our harvest for this year from our little area, and I guess we're going to. Yeah, do you want to pull one out and soak it? Sure. And then I'm going to grab one of these old ones, uh, even though they're probably somewhat mildewy. I almost also have some uh, cedar bark here uh, from a cedar western red cedar tree. What's it? You're gonna, are you going to soak oh, it here? Yeah, let's go ahead and or put are you it. Soak it back. Put oh back. no, let's um, let's just soak it here for a second while I'm c collecting okay. um, some cattail leaves. So I'm going to strip this and into like a few segments. Put it right here into the pond, along with some more cedar, and here's two pieces of cattail that Kim's going to put in. These are a little more delicate than stinging nettle or something else, but you always want to be careful not to make any more bends in them that, than you would, than you can. Um, Kimmer, do you want to hold this and while I grab a cattail leaf directly off of one of these old stocks? Sure. I won't slide in because I'm not wearing my long boots. I'm also going to push. The reason that you have to dry thing harvest and dry things out and then re-wet them when you're going to use them is because when you, um, if you use something green that's sprayed out of you know growing green, uh, you can use it right then sometimes, but then it dries and seasons over time and shrinks, and then everything you wove loosens up. And falls apart, so you need to pre-season or pre-dry them, re-soak them. Different materials need to be soaked for different lengths of time. But I'm gonna grab some cattail here and see if it's still good. As Kim taught you yesterday, you need two pieces or more, and uh, just spin it spin away. Spin it away. Although we're backwards, and so we can't really say what we're doing here. Um, and. Uh, this is going to be a little, quite a bit, oh yeah, see it already broke, because this is already mildewy uh, from be sitting um, here all, all winter long. But anyway, so we'll just use what we pre-harvested. Um, in the fall, when these cattails are just dried, but, not, but before they molded, late summer, you can harvest them, reuse them right there after they've dried and seasoned on the stock. I'm going to grab these out of the water, and it'd be nice to soak them for longer, but for the purpose of our video, which we only want to be 20, 30 minutes, we will... Do you mean to carry him? Sure. All right, we're gonna walk back to the fire pit to point out a few other plants here. There's uh, rushes, and there are sedges. Here's a sedge right here. It has really sharp edges. As a matter of fact, if you go backwards down it, it grabs 
and it would really cut you. A lot of times paper or grass cuts are actually sedge cuts. And the way you tell the difference between rushes, sedges, and grasses, by the way, I'm going to grab one of these nicely uh, fresh leaves and chew on it because all grasses are edible if they don't have any discolorization. Oh, nettle's coming up right here in our nettle patch. There's also a big thistle there. Normally, we cut out all the thistles because they can really take over, but they're a good wild edible. So I'm not sure we want to take that one out. Anyway, so I'm going to get some sugar out of this grass as discussed last week. Let's chew it up. Mm, nice and sweet. And then spit it out when it starts tasting like grass. And that started tasting a little too much like grass. And so I'm going to take a few needles off of this uh, Sitka spruce tree and suck on those mm, for a little after grass. <laughs> treat of vitamin C. So I got a little sugar out of the grass, just like sugar cane comes from a big, huge, tall grass. And some vitamin C if I suck long enough on these pine family trees. By the way, not everything in the conifer uh, division is a pine. Cedars are medicine and Pacific U is poison, although it's Okay, thanks. And it looks like uh, pine, but it's actually uh, in a different family. Very strong chemotherapy drug uh, in some of the U bark. So you want to be careful what's a pine and the pine family with not. That's why I always recommend getting Botany in a Day by Thomas Elpel. Learn your plant families. All right, Kim's going to be right back. She is grabbing some more stuff, and we're here by the fire pit, and she's going to. Well, I'm going to pull out one of these stinging nettles and show you how to process that if she doesn't get back in time to start. Oh, here she comes now. But here's our uh, stash of stinging nettles that we harvested, some of it, uh, last fall. We always like to harvest it in the, uh, September after it's had a chance to propagate and reseed. And, um, and then we harvest it before it starts getting mildewy. And, um, so, hey, oh, can we, um, while you're working on getting the nettles ready, could I grab one of those pieces of cedar? Sure. I'm going to show them how to make, just weave this into rope. And it's not braiding. No, oh, it's not soaked enough. Definitely need to yeah, uh, that's what I'm soak it up. some more. Yeah, I'll take it. That's okay. That's, I'll oh, okay. that's what I'm setting up. Okay, you're setting up. Well, while Kim's doing that, I promise we're going to uh, process one of these nettle stalks. Of course, they're dried, so they don't sting anymore. And um, what you do is get close enough so that you can see. Um, sometimes, if it's really hard, you have to kind of put it on a hard surface and push the you know where the um, where the leaves came out are these little. Might call them uh, nodes, or but they're hard to get there. These stalks, these nettle stalks, are hollow, and so what you want to do is let's see if I can turn this and show you what I'm doing. Split, splay it open. Yeah, there we go. Splay this whole thing open. By the way, I may have learned this for the very first time about 20 or 25 years ago from Karen Sherwood of Earthwalk Northwest in Issaquah. And um, uh, I'm sure they'd appreciate some good business from folks. And um, during this time as well, they have so many skills, the Sherwoods of Earthwalk Northwest. I think it's earthwalknorthwest.com. You can always verify uh, anything you learn about herbal medicine or wild edible foods, in my opinion, by sending an email to Karen Sherwood <laughs> and asking her what she thinks. Uh, all right, so once this is splayed open, what you want to do, do you want to continue this or should I continue? Go for it. Yeah? You're, you're all set. Okay, is that you take about an inch of it and you break it backwards. The outside is what you want to have. You don't want to break it forward so that the outside breaks. You want to break the inside pith. and p the pith and pull the pith out. And this right here, the skin of the nettle stalk, is the um, 
part that you want for fiber. So you can just do another inch, break it backwards. Be very careful when you're pulling it off so you leave all the little fibers okay. on there. I can show how I do it. Hmm? I can show how I do it. Okay, and then let's see how Kim does it. She has a different method. It's really her. similar. I don't usually take off an inch at a time. I usually do a little bit less, um, like a half of an inch. And so I'll pull it backwards until it's about ready to fall off. And then I will pull it forward again because you want every little bit of that fiber to be on there. Even though it looks really crazy, every little bit is going to make your rope that much stronger. So I find for me an inch is a little bit too much. So granted, it'll take a little bit longer, but I don't mind if I get a better amount of material. Oh, um, while Kim is, I'm going to have you sit right there where I was okay. so that you can continue to show them how to make rope with that. Kim just took a uh, towel and covered what the uh, previously harvested cattails and cedar and are coming up getting them really wet right there. Plus it's raining, which is as promised. We wanted to, I wanted to get our fire pit. I haven't gotten, had a fire in here since last fall or even late summer. And we're going to get this ready to go because we have a stretch of rain coming. In order to stay happy through the ages, people have always sat around a campfire. I noticed this weekend some people complaining that the air smelled smoky in Seattle. And that was because a lot of people are having campfires to lift their spirits and are at home. Um, and we only tend to have campfires when it's raining because when it's sunny out, the air in this valley just sits, and so it gets really smoky, um, and we really just do it. So, so while Kim is showing you how to make rope out of that, I'm going to prepare the bed pillow and blanket. Okay, um, so a couple of things I wanted to say about harvesting, and I missed what Chris said, um, but when I harvest, um, I do it in the fall, and um, uh, I like to strip off the leaves out in the forest so the leaves can be where they were always meant to be. Um, looks like I broke off a lot of this at the node, but I'm still going to keep on going. Anyway, um, leave the leaves out in the forest so that they can decompose out there and leave their nutrients out there where they should be. And then when you bring your nettles back in, what I do is I line them up with the bottom or the thicker part of the stalk on the ground or on a towel in my house and um, stand up all of the different stalks kind of together, oh. and but not so close together that they... There's a salamander. <gasps> oh, cool. Oh, here, do you want me to take and relocate him? Yes, for sure. You should show everybody. You gotta look through, dig through this fire pit and make sure that there's no more salamanders. But, Can you tip it? Yeah, let me pull that out of there. Oh, Little beauty. Salamander. Okay, well, I'm going to take that and, and relocate. Well, why don't you, I'll go ahead and do it, and you finish what you're talking about there, and I'll oh, okay. dig through there. I totally forgot what I was saying. Um, anyway, so, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're putting the nettles inside of your house to dry them, uh, make sure not to pack them too closely together, because if you do, they will mold, and I will tell you it is a big bummer to spend all that time out in the woods and all that, hi, all that effort um, harvesting all of those singing nettles and then to have them all mold and go bad. So let them start drying with a little bit of air in between them. Um, and then once they're completely dry, then you can bundle them together like that bundle that you saw that we had uh, before. So that's my tip on drying stinging nettle stalks. How did that salamander go all the way across our <laughs> yard and then... Uh, it was motivated. And then just ended up in our fire Definitely pit. motivated. Well, so, you know, salamanders are considered the fire spirits. So maybe this is a very good uh, sign. Mm. In fact, I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. Look that up, those of you that are interested in old European lore. Well, salamander is actually the name of the fire pit. Okay. Or, excuse me, of the fire of the, spirit. <laughs> the fire pit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so the other thing I wanted to add was, if you ask anyone how they harvest their nettles or dry their nettles or um, harvest them for, or, um, you know, make rope out of them. Everybody's gonna have a different way to do it. It's sort of like art. It's all beautiful as long as it does the job that you want it to do. It doesn't have to look the same. It doesn't have to be the same. So I encourage everyone to go out and actually try it. And then you'll see which method you like best. This just happens to be the method that I like and it doesn't have to be yours. So be an individual, go try it. So anyway, um, I think I'm gonna stop. Do you want me yeah. to stop?
doing this oh, and yeah, just show how to make rope yeah, out of it? Yeah, just another repeat of the Oh, okay. Real quick. All right, real quick repeat. So here's the skin of your stinging nettle. So all I'm going to do is decide where my middle point's going to be. Got my pincher fingers, got my working fingers, and I'm just going to spin it away from myself, which is toward you, but you can go this way. Spin it away, up and over the mountain away, and then I'm going to bring it toward myself, cross over the other piece, pinch it with my working pincher fingers, and then I'm going to let that piece I was working on just hang down. Take the other side that I hadn't been fiddling with, I'm going to spin it away, up and over the mountain, bring it toward me, wrap it in front, pinch, and let it go. And you're just going to do that back and forth and back and forth until you start making your rope. Now, one thing that'll help your rope turn out really, really nice is if both sides are a similar width. Um, if you start getting one side that's thicker and one side that's thinner, what's going to happen is that thick side is going to look thick and then that thin side is going to look like it's just wrapping around and around and around. It looks really crazy and you will totally know when you see it um, because you will. The other and thing so, you want to mention too we didn't do yesterday is what happens when your rope runs out. When your rope gets right, I'm not going to show rope. it on the scene. Though, no, but, but kind of describe it. Before okay, we well, the anyway, so what I was going to say though was if this side was really, really thin and I wanted to try to thicken it up a little bit, all I have to do is take a little bit of material from this side and put it over there. It doesn't matter if you move it back and forth. You just want both sides to be a similar thickness or you can add more material to your thin side. It's totally up to you. Whatever works best with your method. So anyway, spin it away, wrap it in front, pinch. Spin it away, wrap it in front, pinch. I think you guys get the drift of it. And in just and a just second, remember, Kim I'll show you what is, it looks like. It's uh, backwards. Oh yeah, so it's backwards. It's as if Kim's using her left hand right now, where she's. But really I'm not. I'm using my right hand. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter if you're left-handed. It's fine. It doesn't matter which way you go, as long as you go, spin forward, with and if, the individual strands and wrap backwards. And if you watch the tip from yesterday, you remember your pincher fingers don't just pinch super hard because if I let go after all that work, it doesn't unspin. It's really fantastic. So don't worry about that. Now another day we'll have to show you the super secret fast method to do this because there's a faster way but it's good to know the slow way because that's how you add more, more material. Can you talk about what happens if you run out of material? Like Splicing. say you get to the end of there. Um, the end of that. The end of this. Yeah. Okay so I've made my rope all the way down and I'm starting to run out of material on this side. So what I do is I take another piece of material. Pretend you, this is long. Yeah, yeah <laughs> pretend that this is long. Oh, and I drop some. Pretend it's the same width and it's long. Um, and all I do is I get down till I have at least an inch left. And then I just take this one and I lay it right. Oh, I should go backwards. I take this extra piece. I lay it right on top of the other one. And then I continue and pretend like it's always been there. So I still just spit it away, wrap it in front, spit it away, wrap it in front. And this piece, the new piece will get spliced in and then You'll have a nice long piece on your new side, and you're gonna have a little shorty piece on the other side. When this one runs out, you do the same thing. You just lay another piece of material right over the top of it and continue on as if it's always been there. And when you end up with these little pieces that stick out where you did your splice, you can just trim those off later for beautification. All right, so we should go on to fire. Fire. All right, this is gonna be the start of a three-day fire training. And so we're gonna start with um, the fact that you really need a pin. And this is not necessarily for safety, although you should get all of the humus heat material out, especially if you're in a dry area or dry season. Uh, you have to dig a pit because you wanna have air. Um, let's see if I can see, yeah. Say this is a, and then you want air to be able to get sucked down in so you don't have to blow on your fire. And so I'm going to create kind of a channel right here going down in. I don't want to have any rocks in here that might be have been sitting in water over the course of the winter or any high water that was up here because those rocks could explode because they're full of water and if they get hot they can expand and explode. Trust me, I've seen it happen a couple of times. almost me lost too. a couple of eyes. Oh, you almost lost an eye from that happening. Also, you want to be careful that you don't have any conglomerate type um, rocks in there because those really explode bad and easily. So the next thing you want to do is um, have a bed. You want to insulate the ground or your fire from the ground. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. Insulate the ground from your fire from the ground. And so all your worst material, uh, and this could be just leaves and all sorts of things on the ground. You want to get it just absolutely full. Anything that's really soft, go ahead and take it out. But this is just creating a bunch of air lift between the ground 
and your fire first step so that's your bed if you're on um, snow and all you got is a piece of wood you can create a bed just by putting a log or something on top of snow it's not as good because you won't get air pulling down into your fire it'll be elevated up but you could do that next thing you want to do is have a pillow so that's a bed next thing is a pillow and so uh, you can use a big log you can use a rock if you want um, you can just build up a bunch of things that you might have on hand and get a big pillow because we want to have an area that is lifted up one side lifted up I'll have that lifted up let's say it's okay I guess not a lot of space under there next thing you want to do um, after that is to have a blanket to cover your baby fire. The baby fire is going to go start right here and I'm going to pull out the, that and so the next thing is you want to have the best materials you can possibly find. This stuff has all got rained on and so it's not the best but um, I am going to show you how to split a piece of wood so that you can get into some dry stuff. So say this was a piece of wood that you found. You can just put your knife right here, and this is a Frost Mora knife, and you can get one of those off of Amazon for about 20 bucks. And bone dry inside there. Look at that. All right, so that could be a good piece of blanket, something that will catch the flame really well also tall standing grasses but you want all these things long I don't have a lot of good long stuff so I'm gonna grab everything that I have that's long that might burn and lay it up on here this is an old wooden spoon that we burned out and it has a hole in it so I'm gonna burn that <laughs> um, and anything long enough to create kind of a blanket going up to the pillow oh thanks Tina. Could you keep um, creating the pillow and I'm going to uh, prepare, sorry, cre keep creating the uh, blanket with any materials that you can find that might be catch a flame. And I'm going to grab, uh, set up the fire steel and the cotton ball is the best thing to take along with you because these fire steels don't work with all natural materials that you really haven't prepared unless it's dry out already. Um, and you might find a couple kinds of mosses that work. Um, you might be able to shred up really small enough some birch bark and things like that. But um, you really want to, if you're going to have a fire steel, have tinder with you as well. There's no point in having a fire steel and not having tinder. Now, if you do a bow drill fire, like we're going to show you tomorrow, um, you can have all natural material that you find in the woods, and then you can get uh, it going with bow drill. But with fire steel, Always bring tinder with you. So I'll try to start it with one cotton ball, but before I do that, I'm also going to try to start it with jute. So jute, you can probably order it online, but I like to smell it before I buy it in a hardware store or Fred Meyer or wherever. Any kind of hardware area should have um, some jute. And this is all natural material. It's what burlap sacks are traditionally made out of. And by the way, burlap sacks are mostly used now for um, transporting coffee beans from wherever they grow up to the big roasters like we have up the street. So you see that jute really gets down into small strands. We cut this into small pieces so that they're easy to pull apart. So you want to turn this back into its natural fiber. By the way, this jute is spun up exactly like Kim showed you how to uh, weave rope yesterday and today. Uh, the same method is being used. Watch, this is a piece of jute. If I unspin it, you can see that it was a three-strand piece of jute. Pull those individual strands apart and unspin it back the other direction and you get to the na all-natural material. So that's another way to learn how to make rope is just to buy some jute. Hopefully it's more than one strand. It's either two, three, four, or five strands depending on the jute and you can just learn how to make rope by taking it apart. Alright, so I'm going to, I would probably do about 
30 pieces about that big of jute in order to start a fire steel. It's oh yeah. Really, it's wet down here. Yeah, it's fine. Just lay it right across the top. Um, this grass, if it were dry... It was, it was on oh, the ground. It's, it's pretty ground. dry, but it it's was on the ground. Yeah. Let's, it's just wet right here. Okay. Let's try it um, at the bottom, because that's great for a pillow, especially, the, you know, obviously for the, the dry part. Yeah, for the blanket, sorry. Do you want me to get some more? I don't yeah, have more back there standing up. That's great. Okay. All right, I'm going to try to start this. Um, I'll put this cotton ball together with some of this jute, and uh, we'll see if we can get it going. I'm not going to stay online the whole time uh, because this is only about, mm, I don't know, a quarter of the material that we're going to need. Tomorrow I'll have it all set up and ready to go with a bunch. Now, if you ever, ever think that you have enough, double it. And then if you think you have enough, then double that. So I'm going to put this right here. Let's see if you can see it. And you want to keep it on, put it on something dry. I'm going to find the driest piece. There's that piece I just split open. So I think I'll put it on top of that. And when you light your fire steel, put it actually on your tinder. Don't try to do it from up here. Well, I mean, it did get going. <laughs> Because usually those sparks won't take all the way to there. Let's see if we can get this pillow. Let me show you this blanket going. If you do this right, you don't have to blow at all because there's plenty of airflow. And this blanket is critical because, of course, the flame goes up into it. But also it's insulating. And so now I really want to insulate it. And that is the thing that people just don't ever think about when they're doing fire is insulation. Insulation, insulation, just like your own shelter fire needs to be insulated. So if I can insulate this quick enough with anything, keep it hot, it'll keep going. It's cooling off like crazy right now because I didn't insulate it well enough. Um, so I'm going to just start pulling everything I can into it that's not too wet. And ah, just opened up. Found a little bit more somewhat dry material. I'm going to put in here to insulate on this side. Not snuffing it out, so hopefully a flame will hit that. There's still some flame under there. And again, if I insulate, 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 it'll keep going. There you go. There's a little bit more. Oh, look it's, at that beautiful But it's spot. still a little damp. Ah. Oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to get it. Yep, there's a little bit of flame left. Just hot enough to keep lifting, hopefully. If we can get this grass going. It's pretty wet. Can you um, grab anything else to insulate? Because we don't have enough insulation on the top here to keep that um, heat in there. Too much heat escaping right now. There's still plenty of flame in there to pull this, get this uh, grass going. Matter of fact, I'm going to fold it over. Probably insulated enough. Let's see if I didn't smother it. Nope. There's still plenty of airflow. Here it comes. Oh, I gotta get this covered up. Any flame that you see coming up, you've got to cover it. Insulate. So that's probably good enough for today. Um, it should go. Kim's bringing some more wood to help insulate. While that's going, hopefully the smoke won't go right into me, but I uh, got the... Um... Is this okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and cover that up now. Right there. Oh, yeah, perfect. That'll help insulate. I'm going to sing the song that I promised yesterday, but the uh, battery died um, on the way to starting the song yesterday. This is by Ken Longquist. Go to Kenland dot, um, in uh, Facebook or his website, Wisconsin Folk Singer. And I haven't sang this song in
couple, I don't know, several years since I had my all my music stolen <laughs> um, in a parking lot in South San Francisco back when we had the luxury of traveling. All right, I'm gonna get smoked pretty well. <laughs> It goes like this. And this is for the weaving. This has the uh, this is for the, the rope. Let's see if this flames up real of course it's coming right at me now. <laughs> Do you want to sit back here? Because yeah. you're you're visible. Probably you have to sing. The wind loud. generally comes from behind the construction. Yeah. You could bring it a little closer. It goes like this. I'm not gonna spend the time tuning. Thanks everybody. See you tomorrow and be well. <laughs>